talking about video games. Yeah! Welcome everyone to another episode of the Donkey Con Artist Podcast. I have a cold because apparently I ran afoul of a gypsy and I've been cursed this entire year. <laughs> Two people who do not have colds, I don't think, I hope not, are my co-hosts Edmund Arnold and Colin Codega. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling, first off? Because I got a cold in San Francisco last week, so your hometown got me sick. Um, I probably, I'm good by the way, uh, I probably think that it's San Francisco. San Francisco is a nasty city. I don't. I stay away from San Francisco, so that's why I'm always healthy. You like we're in there for a good, what, 24 hours? Yeah, and so I licked everything. Illness around you and everything. I'm only there for like two to three hours at tops. I don't know how Colin didn't stay sick. He's always in San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, I, I go into the city five days a week from work, but Pat, every time we hang out, that's why I always uh, steal your tears because the tears of a gypsy actually keeps your immunity strong. So thank you, gypsy. That's smart. <laughs> so we're going with Pat is a gypsy and not that San Francisco is the nastiest city in America. Is that what we're going with? That could be both. Sick. I don't okay. think they're mutually right. exclusive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be a little bit of both, but like I said, Pat's tears keep me safe. So in other words, people, if you're feeling sick, um, please write into Pat and ask for his tears. Send send a cash or money order to <laughs> Pat's tears. <laughs> Venmo accepted. This oh. is getting weird. I don't like this. <laughs> well, then... <laughs> Let's move on and talk about the big news of this week, which is God of War, which apparently blew every... Apparently, I was one of the people. This game blew everyone's minds. The reviews that this game is getting is absolutely unbelievable. And let me say firsthand, because I've beaten the game, warranted, this game is a masterpiece. And that is written... Masterpiece. Masterpiece in capital letters. It's, it's one of the best games I've ever played on any system, okay. ever. Let me take a step back. What are other masterpieces, in your opinion, that have been developed in, the, in our lifetimes? I don't even have to go that far back, because I think Breath of the Wild was a masterpiece, and I use that word deliberately. I, that game is a masterpiece. It, every part of it is so lovingly crafted, it all comes together in a thing that is a masterpiece. So that game is a masterpiece. To me, Final Fantasy VII is a masterpiece. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that. Other games, mm -hmm. Mario 64 is a masterpiece. It moved the entire series forward. It moved gaming forward. It is a masterpiece. It has continued to play. And obviously, The Legend of Zelda, Orcarina of Time, might be the greatest game ever made. Okay. All right. What would you, what would you call a masterpiece? What's a masterpiece in your opinion? The, the Last of Us, Witcher oh, 3, yeah. um, Alpha Protocol. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 you did not. Uh, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to gauge what a masterpiece is because that's. I guess that's my biggest question before we jump into it. Is because I saw a whole bunch of like game reporters and everyone just calling this game a masterpiece, and I was trying to thinking of what was the last game really that we've seen that every publication kind of jumped on saying that this game was perfect. And I don't even think Zelda was heralded this much. Um, I know Zelda was really loved. Breath of the Wild was really loved, really adored by everyone. But these reviews of God of War have been. I've never seen anything like this. Well, I have seen stuff like this, but it hasn't been since probably The Last of Us. You will... I'm glad you brought up The Witcher 3, uh, which is a game that I, I love. And, uh, you know, until I played God of War, I would call it a masterpiece, too. Uh, the Witcher 3 is amazing. This game blows that game out of the water. This game will leave you with your jaw open. Genuinely, not a metaphor, not an expression. I literally sat there with my jaw open at times watching this game. It is awe-inspiring what they did in this game. Just the visuals alone, not even to get into the story and the gameplay and to completely reinvent a series that's been around for so long. This game blew me away and it blew apparently blew everyone away. I was stunned by what I played in this game. Yeah, I've not seen a single piece of negative review. I think the lowest score I've seen is maybe like an 8.5 out of 10 or a 9, and that's far in between. But I think uh, with the studio, like in the team that put it together, it's, it says a lot just how early they gave review copies to people mm -hmm. and how early the review embargo came up. Nowadays, you see a lot of these developers and publishers making it so, you know, Reviews can't come out until after the game comes out. The fact that they're like, oh yeah, you know, a week before, you can tell people what your impressions are. I think they're like, proof is in the pudding. 
we're just going to give this game, let give time for reviewers to actually put time into it and beat it. And I think that's really cool, and we should applaud the team for doing that, where they actually gave reviewers time to, to really dive into this game and digest it, and I think that's really cool. Sony's Santa Monica Studios, which is the studio behind the game, uh, I can't say enough great things about them, mostly because you know, I've been working with these people since the middle of last year. I think September I released an article about the two leads in, the, in this new game, and even before that I was in contact with them, and they've been great to me and just lovely, lovely people, so I like them personally, but also just the amount of love that they poured into this game, and you can tell when you go there. I mean, they have a they have a seven-foot statue of Kratos and Atreus as soon as you walk through their front doors. And everyone there is just living and breathing God of War for five years. And it just shows in every single aspect of this game. And they completely just... They reinvented the wheel and just blew this thing out of the water. It's... I, I, I'm, I'm trying not to gush too much, but it, it is one of those games. It's just something special. Now, um, Pat, if, if you don't mind asking, how, how much do you think... Corey Barlog getting back involved with Sony Santa Monica really led to God of War hitting this this potential masterpiece uh, status. So uh, two things about that. Number one is that Corey Barlog was the Barlog, sorry, he was the lead animator of God of War one, and then he went on to be the co-director of God of War two. God of War two, in my opinion, and most people I would say, is sort of the it was the highlight of the series before this. When he left in God of War three, you could kind of feel it. The story got a little bit. That cheesy isn't the word, but not as not as not as deep, <laughs> I guess. And then this one was, you know, him coming back and his full fledged masterpiece. But they they tracked him down because he had left. Uh, Shannon Studsill, the head of Santa Monica Studios, she tracked him down and would not let him not come back, basically, because they just thought his vision was the vision to take Kratos to where he is now. And I don't know how he came up with this. Uh, I'll speak to him about those decisions. But he brought something to the table that I don't think anyone expected from this character. So I think a lot of the credit goes to Corey Barlog himself. Not to take anything away from the team, and obviously I wasn't part of the, the game-creating process here, but his vision really is something in this game. Yeah, it, it seems interesting because that's where I'm seeing a lot of praise is being thrown towards the story. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like this thing is like a technological masterpiece in which there's no hiccups, there's not a lot of bugs, everything just flows seamlessly. So I, I, I guess in that, in those terms, I'm not saying that it's not a masterpiece because I haven't played it yet, but I guess in those terms I can get behind it being a masterpiece rather than The Witcher 3 because The Witcher 3 had a lot of bugs when it first came out mm. and the game really took about, what, two years through the cycle for it to really be playing like it should be playing. So the fact that they released a game that's not broken when every game that's being released these days are in early access or they're releasing a broken game that requires a 30 gigabyte first day DLC, I think I'm impressed. I am, I'm really impressed because it seems like they're doing everything right in the video game industry right now where every other studio seems like they're doing everything wrong. Well, and this is a caveat, obviously. I haven't played it as well, um, just like Edmund, but... I think it says something, because I also am in the camp of thinking Witcher 3 is a masterpiece. I do think that game is. Now, to Edmund's point about with the development, or with it, it did the team with uh, Witcher, they actually did do some um, updates early on, changed how the camera moved, um, you know, changed some gameplay elements. And I think that, you know, the... God of War, what excites me the most is I think it's going to change our definition of what we expect with video games, which is huge, in, in being that it is a clean, polished game from, from release, from what I'm hearing. Um, Pre-release, even before a day one. They could even do a day one patch. People are saying this game runs so smoothly. I mean, technically, how, how did it run, Pat? Oh, it ran phenomenally. I'll, I think there were two issues of frame rate issues. I don't have a PS4 Pro, and I'm not playing on a 4K nice. TV. Oh. That, right there. Yeah, don't buy this game because of those two frame rates. Yeah. <laughs> buy PS4 Pro before you buy this game. Yeah, well, actually, you should do that because just to see the graphics in this game, just the visuals in this game, you're, you're going to want to buy a new TV for this. This game is unbelievably beautiful. But yeah, those were the only two times, and they weren't even, they were just frame rate issues for like one chug for like maybe like three seconds of just the camera kind of keeping up with me as I was moving. That happened twice. I played the game about 35 hours. Okay. 
right, that's exciting. Okay, so I, I'm going into this not reading anything. You're like my go-to person for this. I did read your review, which is on The Hollywood Reporter. Anyone who's listening to this, go check it out. It's really nice good. Nice plug. Um, but what is different about Kratos in this? Without being spoiler heavy, Ooh. what can you tell me about Kratos that is different than this game that's... Um, that would make me forget about Kratos in the other games. Because I'm coming into this thinking that Kratos is boring. Kratos is one no care kind of character, like whiny kind of. What about him should I be excited about approaching God, this God of War um, installment? It's really hard to talk about this game because I don't want to get into this. But there's so many wonderful moments in this game. Moments that, I don't know, I'm not this type of person at all. But it made me tear up a couple times in this game because of how beautiful the story was. First off, I'm never I'm, I, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I've never seen you cry. Kratos is voiced by a new actor. His name is Christopher Judge, who deserves some type of award for his performance in this game. The depths that he goes to and minds for emotionality in this game are stunning. Kratos, from the very beginning, is a completely different character. He's much older in this game. He's much more patient. He's kinder. He is not quick to violence. In fact, there's a lot of times where he restrains himself from violence in this game, which is the complete opposite of what this character has always been. There are moments where you can feel him wanting to be the father that he wishes he was. You can tell there are moments where he's conflicted about what he has to do. He is a completely different character, and they added so much depth into this guy who was basically... Like everybody says, he was... I don't think he was completely one note, but he was much more one note. And now there is a depth to his character that is... I don't know how they wrung this out of that character. But you can't go back. I mean, I can't imagine going back and playing the first three God of Wars after playing this game because of how wonderful Kratos is in this game and how complex he is. And just... Ugh, I've never seen a game where you have a companion where you actually feel like you have a companion for the entire game. There are brief moments in the game, and I don't want to give things away, where Atreus is not right next to you, and you miss him when he's gone. I mean, deeply. You want to get back to him as quickly as possible, because you want this character. He's great in combat. He's great as just a foil to Kratos. The dialogue in this game is amazing, and it never stops. You really feel like you're on a quest, and that you're just talking with your buddy as you're going through it. And I just love the idea of having... Um, it's, it's Atreus is the, uh, the, the kid, correct? Yes. So Trace, I think the coolest thing, just from some of the footage I've seen and, and just from what I've been uh, listening and hearing about, how he actively will call out, like, you know, because the camera isn't quick to move and you kind of have to worry about what's happening behind you. Oh, yeah. And he'll actually give you, um, you know, audio cues of like, hey, there's archers over to the side or someone's coming up behind you. Is oh, that yeah. kind of, and he's super helpful, correct? And, and yeah, it's not just that, though. I mean, when you're exploring the world, and there's a lot of exploration in this game, which is, I think, what surprised most people, that the game is... It's not open world, but there are times when it kind of feels like an open world game, if that makes any sense. There's a lot to do outside of the main quest. And Atreus, as you're, you spend a lot of time rowing in a boat, uh, Atreus will point things, literally point them in a game, and be like, what's that over there? And his character will point, and then you'll go and go over there, and then you'll start on a new side quest. I got this game at the beginning of April, and I had about two weeks to beat through it. The first about six days of me playing it, I realized that I wasn't going fast enough, and that I had to hurry through the story, because I had spent... 10 hours just doing side quests and loving it. Just loving walking around exploring this world with this kid. And doing nothing that was related to the main quest. And that's... Look, a lot of games do that, but this one really nails it. Where even the side quests really feel like they're part of the main quest. They're so deep and so full of dialogue and exploration that you just want to spend time in this world. I, I beat this game four days ago, and I've spent just as much time over the last four days playing it as I did before I beat the main quest. And that was surprising to me because Colin even commented, oh, Pat, just beat God of War. And I was like, oh, wow, that's surprising. I haven't seen him beat a game that wasn't Final Fantasy in <laughs> years. How was the combat? Was it something that was approachable to you as someone who hasn't played? Because I've seen a lot of people compare it to Dark Souls and mm. like that type of heavy. As someone who's never played Dark Souls, was the combat approachable to you? Did you find it too hard at first? Was it frustrating? How did you feel about it? There are three different... Uh difficulty settings. I played on the easiest because, you know, I had to beat the story for my job. So I played on the okay. easiest setting. 
Uh, the medium setting is what I played for the first three hours when I got to do a demo of the game. That was significantly harder than the easy setting. The easy setting really let you play through, and uh, the only times I game over screened on the easy setting was the puzzles, because you can game over sometimes on puzzles. I never game over it in combat. Until post-game, late game, post-game, when the difficulty rating slams way, way up, even in the easy setting. Um, so, it was easy to approach on that setting, having played the other settings, now I'm going back and trying to play the more difficulty settings. There is a challenge, but the game kind of learns with you. Um, and also, I'm going to say this, people were wary about changing Kratos' weapons in this game. The Blades of Chaos are gone, they're replaced by the Leviathan Axe. This new weapon is one of the best weapons I've ever used in any game. It's like Thor's Mjolnir Hammer, where he throws it and can call it back. The way it feels when you call this thing back, I mean hundreds and hundreds of times, every time, it's the most satisfying feeling. It vibrates in just the right way. The sound effect that it has. Dude, the axe is the greatest thing ever. It is so amazing. And combat is deep. You unlock combos as you go and new moves. And it's funny. In a lot of games, you'll get these new combos and be like, well, I'll never use that because I can't remember how to use it. You use everything in this game. It is amazing how quickly you learn it. Uh, yes. like, you feel like a master, almost like you're playing a fighting game by the end of this game. Because the game requires you to. You have to use different techniques for a whole bunch of different uh, enemies throughout the game. I've actually heard that comparison, that combat feels like you're actually mastering a fighting game like yeah. Injustice or Street Fighter, where you're learning the combos, you figure out, like, based on the situation, just kind of like a, a Street Fighter pro is going to be like, oh, I'm going against this character, I'm going against Ryu, so let me switch to this character, let me go someone who's a little bit faster, so you may actually, like, try to use a different, quicker combo, and uh, <laughs> that's what... And one thing, Pat, I would I would hope when um, you know when you uh, do eventually speak to uh, Corey Barlog, uh, I would like to hear about the QA testing because I heard it was pretty interesting with the team where there was a lot of dialogue on how they're going to change the combat early on. Mm -hmm. From what I hear, he had a lot of input on they would you know take him with the build, and there was a lot of back and forth and debate on how to handle the axe throwing and how to release it back. At first, it was going to be an automatic uh, trigger, I guess. And then he actually fought for a lot of, like, no, let's get this so you can leave it out. Um, yeah, vibrate on the controller, and mm -hmm. let's try to make it so the player actually is trying to set up combos and get a line of enemies cool. so when you get the axe to come back to you, you're taking out hey, enemies as it comes back. Hold up. So when you throw this axe, are you just, like, stomping people down with your fist? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Or oh, man. do you have, like, a selection of items or, <laughs> or a selection of weapons? Or how does this... Because this sounds amazing to me. Let me talk about this axe for just a little bit. First off, you can aim at different parts of enemies. So if you cut out their legs, they fall, and then you can attack them on the ground. But you also recall the axe, right? So you throw it, and then it comes back to you. When it comes back, it can hit enemies. So if you throw it strategically, you can get them twice and get multiple enemies multiple times when you throw the axe. You can also hit them in different levels. You know, you hit, you hit a big Draugr's legs, take the Draugr down, and then your son will jump on its back and start stabbing it. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, there's tons play. of this stuff. You also have, you have one button, it's square, is denoted, it's, it's devoted to Atreus. So every time you hit square, that's his button. And he learns different moves as you go on, too. So you're literally, you're doing a combo between two different characters. You'll throw your axe, have Atreus shoot an arrow at it, recall the axe, cut out its legs, and then Atreus will jump on the thing and start stabbing it. Meanwhile, you're punching another Draugr in the face as you're doing this. And you're, you're actively, um... The, the player's act, actively cl like clicking on a command on the controller to recall the axe, correct? Like, it's not auto-triggered? Yeah, it's, it's mapped to triangle. There's also two different ways to throw the axe. The axe has an ice effect, because you're in you know Midgard, in Norse mythology. So you freeze different enemies, uh, and a different throw freezes things more. And some enemies you have to freeze. You know, there's things that burrow underground, so you freeze them before they do that. There's also enemies that you can only beat by throwing your axe at them. You can't just go up and start hacking them. They're too big. They'll stomp on you. So, I mean, the, the, the gameplay is deep, and it's, it's so satisfying. No game, and this is exactly what we want from somebody like Kratos, because he is the most badass character in all of media, but you want to feel like a badass, and by the end of this game, you feel like the most badass character of all time. You're just going up to things and just punching them in the face. Sometimes I would just beat things down with my bare hands, because I... Like, I wanted, it felt too easy to beat them with my axe, so I would take the axe out and just beat them with my bare hands to feel more badass. Like, it was so easy for me to beat it that I would beat it with my hands. This conversation is just making me think that, like, maybe that's what action RPGs or action 
these type of titles need to start doing because as much as I loved Uncharted, Uncharted 4 got kind of, you know, it got kind of old with the gunplay. Right. And it seems like if you're going to do this type of type of gameplay or type of game, you need to have an innovative weapon. And it seems this is what holds, not just the technological stuff, not just the story, but it seems like the actual weapon that the character wields holds some type of like superiority over other games that we see. Let me t- let me tell you, Eddie, as someone who was late to Uncharted and I played the remastered the collection, the Legacy collection, I played all three within a few weeks. And let me tell you, all of those games, once you get towards the last third yeah. or fourth, are so like I'm just like get this over with. Yeah, right. Like I was like, I just want to see the story. It sounds like I mean, I don't know, Pat, like when when the credits rolled and this game was done. Did you, were you like, set the controller down being like, okay, I got my experience, I'm done with this? Because that's how I feel with Uncharted. Or were you like, hey, I need to crank up the difficulty, I want to go get collectibles, I want to platinum the trophies, like, how did you feel once the game ended? I want so badly to spoiler, like, review this game, because this stuff, like, all these questions have, like, different answers than what I'm going to give you. But no, not at all. I mean, the credits rolled, and I walked right into another mission. Okay, that's pretty rare, like... I, that's, I don't think I've ever had truly that experience in beating a game like Grand Theft Auto, Horizon, Mafia 3. I had that experience. Mafia when I was out Mafia 3, I wanted to kill more white people. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but no, you're right though, Colin, because a lot of times these games drag on for so long. And I, Uncharted 2, I didn't have that feeling with Uncharted 2, because Uncharted 2 was just like a oh, goddamn Fast and Furious movie. It was like from start to finish, you were like at the edge of your seat. Uh, Witcher 3 was one of those games where I had to like take a break from the middle of it and come back to it, but I still enjoyed it very much because the game was so long. I still loved it, but it was, it's one of those things where a lot of these games, they drag on, so it seems like like Horizon is a perfect example. Horizon had a very good weapon system. It had a very good weapon system, something that we've never seen before, and that game was, like, people loved that game, and it was it right. was stood out that year, last year. So it seems like if you're going to make this type of game, or even if you're going to try to do, like, revamp a game like God of War, revamp it like a Crash Bandicoot or Spyro, you need to do some type of innovative weapon change or some type of innovative change to the character itself or the game itself. Or you just just don't do it then, Every, in my opinion. Everything in this game is ramped up. If We keep comparing it to other games, right? And great games. Wonderful, wonderful games. And, and the, what I'm about to say is not taken away from those games, because The Witcher 3 is amazing, Horizon Zero Dawn is amazing, Zelda Breath of the Wild is amazing. Everything that those games do, and what makes them great, if those are at a 10 or a 9, this game is two notches above that. Everything that every other game you've ever seen does, this just turns it up. The graphics are the greatest thing I've ever seen. I don't even understand how they did this. It looks better than real life. I mean, buy a new TV, for real. It is, just, just watch this game. I would play with my fiance, and she would just, like, look at it. Because it's so amazing. The story is one of the best things I've ever seen in anything, let alone a video game. Talk movie. It's like reading a novel. It's so deep. There's so much mythology. There's so much backstory. There's so much world building. The gameplay is unbelievable. They reinvented it. The combat is satisfying. It has this heavy chunk to it. It is just... Every single aspect of this game makes other games look worse by comparison. It is the standout of this generation by such a wide margin that I almost feel bad for other game developers. I mean, it's it really the the corny phrase to throw out though. Like I, I hear in business a lot, but it's it's very true. It, it sounds like Sony Santa Monica. They they really went out and they're like, hey, let's set the new standard in video games. And it's it sounds like they did that. Like I can I feel like I can confidently say that without playing a single second of this game because. It's across the board, yeah. the, the reviews and just the amount of passion people are speaking with in this game. Um, it's, in, it's insane. It's yeah. very, very impressive. And I've never... It, video game community can be such a divisive and people love being contrarian and having a hot take. It's really crazy and almost weird and startling to see everyone agree on something. And just really quick, I just want to run down the God of War review scores. Game Informer gave it a 9.75. Polygon gave it a 10. GameSpot gave it a 9. IGN gave it a 10. Eurogamer recommended it. VentureBeat gave it a 90 out of 100. Push Square gave it a 10. Easy Allies gave it a 10. Destructoid gave it a 10. God is a, God is a Geek gave it a 10. Metroid gave it a 9. And these are just like some of the top publications out there. So 
And then the Hollywood Reporter obviously gave it a good review too. The Hollywood Reporter gave it a 10. (laughs) What what did you give it? You you, you need a rating scale, Pat, by the way. Well, Um, we don't do that at my publication, so. Oh, you guys don't do that. Well, because we're a trade. I kind of enjoy not having the review rate. Like, I kind of wish more places went away with not stamping on a number because I feel like it's so easy the first week when something's out to stamp a number and then you're stuck to that forever. And people for years of the internet are going to call you out because games perception of games change over time. That's true. Not to That's mention, true. I mean, like you, you put a number on it and people don't read the review. <laughs> like, oh yeah, true. Yeah, I know. I don't. Right. I go straight down to the number. I mean, yeah. hey, just look at that. You just read off all those numbers, but when it comes to actually reading content, you go to the True Hollywood Reporter to Patrick Shanley's yeah. articles. You actually read the whole thing. And, yeah. and by the way, God of War is Patrick Shanley approved, as you can tell. So, <laughs> uh, um, can we can we get a stamp with Pat's face on it, just saying Patrick Shanley approved, with like a thumbs up? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think that's what we need to do. Um, like, I, 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 it's, I'm just well, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just I'm gushing about this game and. I, I wish you guys had played it because there's no other way to talk about it, frankly. I, I know it might sound like I'm in like the pocket of like Sony or something like that, or I'm just like, oh, like I'm a rah-rah cheerleader. It, it really is something special, and it, this is the definition of a game that you buy day one. It is worth $60 right out of the box. Like I said, I got this over three weeks before the game was released, and it was perfect. There's not a single load screen in this entire game. It just goes seamlessly. There are times, I think I've said this before, where I be still pushing forward on the control stick because I thought it was still playing and I'd be in a cutscene for <laughs> over 40 seconds. This thing is so engrossing. I am not one of these people who sits down and plays video games for seven hours at a time. Right? In fact, I really dislike doing that. This game made me do that not only because it's my job, but because I enjoy doing it. In the terms of tone, what type? Of, could you compare it to a movie for us? Like, What type of tone is it? Is it a dark? Is it darker than usual? Is it kind of a... Does it have humor part in it? There's a lot of humor. Oh, yeah. it does, really? Oh my god, so much humor. It's actually, there was a couple like laugh out loud moments in this game. And it's it's played off of how grumpy Kratos is. He's the most unhumorous person who ever lived. Or God, I guess. He's not really a person. Okay. And so his son is a kid, and he's, you know, interested in the world around him. And the they're, they're side characters in this game are so good. The dwarves in this game are the best characters I've ever seen in any game. They are phenomenal. I love them. I heard the uh, character that handles your upgrades and armor yep. and stuff like that. I don't know if he's like a blacksmith or something, but whoever it is, I hear is a real standout character. He is. His name is Brock, and he has a brother named Sindri. I hope that's not too spoilery, but I feel like it's not. You meet them pretty early on. They're both they're amazing, and they're so completely different than each other. Brock is this badass, tough-as-nails blacksmith, and his brother is this like guy who's afraid of dirt and hates dirtiness, but he's a dwarf <laughs> and a blacksmith. Did you, did you learn about Norse mythology? Did so much. Okay. Yeah, I was going to Google like all the time. Uh, Atreus has a, a journal, and he fills out... A lot of the things that you find in this game, they don't even have anything to the game. It's just mythology. That's it. You know, they're not part of like a quest. You just look at something, and he writes it down. And I was constantly going to Google to learn stuff about Norse gods and Norse mythology. And uh, the monsters, too. There's such a variety of monsters in this game. It starts off, and you think, like, oh, I'm going to be killing Draugr for, like, 20 hours, and it, that is not the case. So, it, 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 does it still follow the same God of War formula, where you have these big epic boss battles where you're fighting the, the main Norse gods, and not like, I don't know anything about Norse mythology. Is okay. Cyclops the Earth, or is that, that's Greek, right? That's um, Greek. I can't get into that so much. I uh, say okay. it's probably pretty, pretty spoiler-heavy okay. on the actual gods and stuff. I okay. will say that it's not at all the formula of past God of War games, and this story is much deeper and very, very this is a weird game. The main quest is mirrored, so your relationship with Atreus is mirrored by other things that are happening in the game in a really, really brilliant way. The game is heartbreaking, but it's also there's a lot of hope and just it's an optimistic game and it's a very, very sweet game. And it's weird to say this about a God of War game, but it's kind and it's it's nice. It's it's a yeah, great, it's weird. great, great story. Is there is there a possibility for a sequel? Oh yeah. Um, Again, without getting too spoilery, I mean, who knows who would even be in a sequel? Like, how's that for a tease? Uh, okay. But yeah, I think so. I think you'd be insane to not come back to this well that you created here. I mean, this is setting up, forget all the other three God of Wars, this is the new God of War. Okay. Okay. And there's also I mean, some, there's probably going to be some DLC, I would imagine. 
Yeah, because I saw in January they they came out and said there'll be no season pass. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, but that could still mean instead of a season pass, they just do one standalone DLC um, that's full of like solid content. That's that's kind of me with no information. I kind of think that may be their route. Um, Because I think that it seems like Sony Santa Monica is very... Everything has been very planned, and they I feel like they took a good look at the video game landscape, and they're like, what is working well in games, and what is not right now, and how can we do something that, like, I mean, like we said, we threw out the phrase masterpiece, but I feel like everything has been, it's been so methodical in, in how they've created this, where I think with all of the negativity on season passes, DLC, like, what if they do something, it's going to be meaningful, and it's going to be maybe... Just like one standalone DLC, and it adds on to the story, or it's something completely different. But um, I, I have full confidence in their decision making. Yeah, I think if they're going to do it, it's going to be what was it, the Champions Ballad from Breath of the Wild? Like one DLC, a DLC that is just like it's its own thing and just adds on to the game, and then like that's it. That's all you get. Now we're moving on because we've already this was our our opus. You know, we're done. This is it. Now we're moving on. This this is insane. I mean, I have a physical copy pre-ordered. I'm, I have a quick trip I'm taking this next week, unfortunately, but I'm going to probably cancel my Amazon pre-order and get the digital copy just so I can play it Thursday night and get some time in before my, my quick trip over the weekend because this just sounds amazing. Oh, you guys, I'm so excited to talk to you about this game. And I'll, I'm going to be getting it next Thursday, so I'm going to be trying to push through it. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe like two weeks from today, we, we plan on doing like a spoiler cast. Yeah, I think I that's feel- enough time afterwards. Um, yeah. Like, well, like just an episode specifically on... We'll just go through all the God of War spoilers. There's so many awesome moments in this game, especially, I mean, if you're a fan, they resonate even deeper, but you don't have to be a fan to like get the things that happen in this game. And there's so many, there's about three or four twists in the main story that are just like, what in the world when it happens? It's, it's unbelievable. I'm excited. I mean, everything you're saying, everything that I've heard, I've read about is exciting. I, I have like a two part question. Number one, when you talk to Corey Barlow, could you please ask him if there's going to be another fat princess? We need another fat princess. <laughs> um, and also, Colin brought up a really good point, whereas... I wonder if game studios are going to see this and act and think like this is how we need to release a game now. It needs to be complete. It needs to be just working on all, just pumping on all cylinders. But then on the other hand, you see mo- most of these games like Sea of Thieves kind of taking over and all these games like being released in early, 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 early access. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that, do we think that God of War will set some type of precedent where people will take a step back and think like, Maybe early access isn't the way that we should be releasing these games. Or when you play a game like Radical Heights, like I got, I had a chance to get my hands on. Does it make sense to play games in early access rather than I, I don't know, or it's, I don't know if that if this question is making sense. But it seems like we're going towards this early access trend in games. It's getting huge. Every game is doing it to the point where they're not even releasing like a beta. They're releasing the game in pre-alpha, right. which is insane to me. So does God of War, do these developers see God of War and be like take a step back and being like okay we need to we need to start taking time putting time and then releasing a full game or do they just keep doing this early access not, nonsense? Well, yeah, I mean it's different types of games and we'll see what the sales are for God of War because obviously it, it's different types of games, different types of audiences. I guess I hope if you're going to make a game that's story driven, it, first off I hope that people still keep doing that, but then we'll see <coughs> uh, how this like, reflects in the industry afterwards. I will say, though, and and this isn't meant as, like, a knock, really, on Far Cry 5, but, like, Far Cry 5 was a big AAA title, and just the reviews of God of War smushed it, you know? (laughs) Well, well, I think that's a good point that you bring up, Pat, because this is the fifth Far Cry, right? Right. And God of War, this is, what, the 20th God of War? (laughs) Well, yeah. It's the fourth main one, yeah. It's the 8th, okay, 20th, 30th, uh, (laughs) and it completely revamped it, right? Far Cry has done the same thing over and over and over again, and this time it finally got railed by reviews, but people still bought it. Right. Yeah, so yeah, it was I, a huge seller, but... Yeah, it was a huge seller. I don't I don't know how God... I think God of War is going to do really well, but it just... And I know I got off my last question, but it... I think it comes down to money. It comes down to money, what the studio actually wants to do. I, I think 
most studios are still going to push for the early access because it's more profitable. You can continually get money from people early on while you're building the game. And um, games like Far Cry, they're going to continue to push those out because they know they're going to get, a lot of people are going to buy it. They have the DLC they can tack on that's going to be for a season pass. Now games are moving to seasons where it's like they'll have multiple years of DLC content where they're not even really building a new game. Oh, and um, so, yeah, I just think financially, I think... In, in a perfect world, since we are video game enthusiasts, it would be nice that everyone took the Sony Santa Monica approach. But I don't think one. It, I don't think a lot of studios have the technical team to put together a masterpiece like this. If everyone could make a game like God of War, I think they would go out and do it. Right. But I think studio heads are smart enough to know what their return yeah. on investment's going to be. And if they see, hey, you know what? We're not going out to make a masterpiece. Let's make a pirate game where you can run around and play with your friends and we can do it in early access. Right. Well, let me wrap it up with this then. If you're an artist and you care about making a piece of art, with your game, and I'm not even saying that you have to be or that like you're better than other people if that's like what your goal is, something that like resonates for a long time and is like the top of the industry, like a stalwart that people look at for years and years and years, like an ordinary of time. If you are that type of game developer, somebody who wants to make something that's a piece of art, then this game is going to shake you and it's going to, it, it flew a flag and this is now the standard that you have to live up to. That's what this game is. It's the top of this generation and it will be forever when you look back on it. Oh, and I've heard that sentiment from a lot of people, which that is interesting. That's true. I mean, there's nothing so, else to call this game. That's that's what this game is. So basically, we should be holding these big studios to a higher standard. Like, we should have revolted when Far Cry 5 came out, <laughs> is basically what I'm hearing. No, oh. I'm not saying that, necessarily. I mean, Far Cry 5 is a fun game. You don't have to do that. I'm just saying, if you're going to act like that's what you're doing, if you're going to say, like, this is our masterpiece, then, dude, like, sorry, but you're not even close. Like, look at what these guys did. Yeah, I mean, it look like like I referenced earlier the fact that they they're like, hey, proofs in the pudding. Like people for Far Cry weren't like, hey, here's the game three weeks in advance. We're gonna lift the embargo a week before. Like Sony Santa Monica knew what they had on their hands. It's it's, and I think what Pat said, Pat's been able to go and see the studio, see the development kind of over the long term, and getting to know the studio and seeing how much of a passion project it is. And not to trash talk Ubisoft or anything, but I'd be curious to see if you got a bunch of Ubisoft employees in the room who worked on Far Cry. Are they going to sit there and have that passion and talk about it like you would from someone from Sony Santa Monica? And I think that says it all right there. Good point. Good point. All right. And when was the last full release of God of War? Was, it, was this like eight years in the making of this one? This one was five years. But yeah, the last one was uh, 2010 was God of War 3. Okay, and then God of War Ascension, that's not, we don't count that as a God of War release on PlayStation 3? No, not really. I mean, it's not the same type of thing, you know? Like, okay. that was like a spinoff. Okay. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe studios need to just take more time to, like, take a step back and develop these games. Frankly, but I mean, like, that's not an easy thing to do, because you're not making money while you're doing that, so it's like... Yeah, that's true. It, it, it all comes down to what the goals of your studio is. Is it someone like Sony Santa Monica that has the backup of Sony right. as being the parent of the company? They get that flexibility. Ubisoft is its own entity. It doesn't have, like, the Sony brand to kind of make this first-party... Uh, like, they're making games for every system, and they're going to, like, since uh, God of War, that five-year period, there's been about three or four Far Cries that have come out in that time. So it, their, their objective is to make money and to make money for their investors. Sony Santa Monica, I think their goal is to get first-party games out that, that make the PS4 the system to buy. And we're, we're saying that big name studios, they need to make money. What has held Sony Santa Monica up for so long since they haven't released a game in 10 years? Sony. Their their own their parent uh, company Sony that owns the PlayStation, so they, they want to make first party games. Because their Wikipedia is like the last games that they've collaborated with have been terrible. Like the Order eighteen eighty six was a game by Sony Monica Studios. They collaborated with Ready at Dawn. Uh, everybody's gone to Rapture, which was a good game, but it didn't sell particularly well. Fat Princess Adventures was another one that didn't sell particularly well, but they collaborated with Fun Bits Interactive. Bound was another one that they collaborated with. So do we need to see more big-name studios collaborate with these little-name studios to keep releasing titles so that they can sustain themselves to make these bigger titles? Or does it need this micro... So, for example, like Microsoft doesn't have a Sony Interactive right now. So does Microsoft really need to get behind a rare-type company and really support them in the same way that Sony Interactive, Sony Interactive has so supported Sony Harmonica Studios? Well, I mean, can we just say that 
let's applaud Sony. I mean, literally, like applaud Sony for just yeah, absolutely dominating. The only ones releasing exclusives right now that are worth playing. And just, I mean, hit after hit after hit right. after hit, just blowing people out of the water. But like, Microsoft isn't showing any signs of wanting to do that. Like, if I was Microsoft, like, what are you doing? Sony is just—they're embarrassing you right now. Yeah, and I know I'm rambling a lot right now. I'm just trying to figure out, like, why, what this studio did. Like, what type of steps they took in the last 10 years to release a game of this magnitude. Because we've seen so many other studios just slowly go downhill. And it seems like Santa Monica Studios was able to do, like, a revert, a quick 180 reverse. And you just don't see a lot of studios doing that anymore. What, yeah, I think, like I said, I keep going back to it's the fact that they are owned by Sony. Sony so owns, they, yeah. they have the backing of the parent company that's going to give them that time and flexibility. Where most other businesses like Ubisoft, these big developers, they have pressures by investors to get games out as soon as possible. That's just like... Um, the, the fact that no one knows why Yakuza 6 got moved a, a month and a half out of nowhere a few months ago. <clears throat> but really, at the end of the day, they moved it into April because of financials. And they were like, oh, if we release this in another quarter, it's going to help our company financials. Yeah. Sony Santa Monica, it doesn't seem like they have to worry about that type of stuff. And they're just told, hey, go out and make this game that's going to make PlayStation the console to buy when someone has to make that decision. I mean, it, it's something to be absolutely... I mean, they went through layoffs in 2014, yeah. and four years later, they're releasing <clears throat> one of the best games of the generation. So I just, I mean... I, I'm just, like, flabbergasted that a studio... Because we, we just hear so many horror stories, you guys know? Like, and it's just... For a studio to turn around, I just... They should be given every type of award there is out there, Dude. in my opinion. Yeah. And I'm not trying to, like, jump on their coattails <clears throat> or, like, rah, 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 you know, the studio, but it's something that should be... Should be put up on a pedestal. And it is, currently. I mean, look yeah, at the absolutely. reaction. It'll be fun to see when it hits fans, you know, when it hits the public, to see how people react to this game. But I, I, I cannot... I'm eagerly anticipating the release just so I have people to talk to about this game. Oh, just wait a week. We'll be talking... I'll probably be texting you every big moment. Like, oh my god, Pat! I'm worried I'm not going to go to sleep Thursday night because when you digital download on PlayStation, I can play it at 9 p.m. Pacific on Thursday night. Like, I'm worried that I'm going to go into work on Friday not sleeping a week. Good. Yeah, Plan good. I should be. I'm not working Friday, so we're good. Yeah, working a sick day on that Friday. Yeah, I took I took a sick day on that Friday. It's a big game release, man. You got to take a sick day. Yeah. I have no kids, no wife. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Let's get real, all right? Uh, yeah. Anyway, there you have it. <laughs> Pat's God of War review. He recommends it for everyone. Please go buy this game. If you're listening to this, please go out and spend your money on this game, especially if you're the type of person complaining about paid DLC, especially if you're the type of person complaining about games being released unfinished. Just go, just go show your support so we can get more games like this. Thank you. Put your money where your mouth is. This is the type of game you should be supporting. Yeah, buy two if you can. I thought about going out and buying one just to support Santa Monica Studio. I mean, I bought a, a I bought a PlayStation Four Pro just so I just for this game, so I can see what it looks like. I what I think we need to do is go back once we do our spoiler cast, and let's just listen to the audio of Eddie from a couple weeks just trashing this game and right. saying how he's not. No, I did not trash this game. I you didn't trash it. I trashed the series. I didn't trash this game. I was very speculative about this game because Kratos is a terrible character. I, oh, I know. Oh. Sounds like. It sounds like from every review that I've read, they have fixed what I thought was wrong about Kratos. They actually gave him a little bit of depth, rather than just being like, oh, I'm mad, my family was killed, and I have to kill everyone. They actually gave him some, a little bit of, you, you actually feel for Kratos, it sounds like. Whereas in the last ones, he was just like a meandering idiot to me. Yeah, but hey, like I said, I still want to go back and get the audio, slice it up, so we can do the before and after of uh, Mr. Negative uh, Pessimistic Eddie, <laughs> and then uh, playing this masterpiece of a game. We'll have a Let's Laugh at Eddie podcast. Oh, isn't that every podcast? Yeah, yeah pretty much. New segment, Laugh at Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, let's talk a little bit about Radical Heights, which is a new game from Cliff Blitzitsky. 
Is that his name? Cliff Blazinski? How do you say his last name? Blazinski? Cliffy B! Cliffy B! Uh, this is sort of, it feels like one of the games that just kind of benefited from the time that it came out, because it just so happened that Fortnite servers went down, so like, I don't know, do you want to call, maybe there's some foul play, maybe Cliffy B <laughs> nuked the servers <laughs> of Fortnite for his game. So, I had the very, um, I had the pleasure of playing this game for about four hours yesterday, I'm not going to lie, I came home thinking I was going to play some other stuff, saw this game was free to play, saw everyone talking about it this week. So I downloaded it. It is rough. It is rough, 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 to say the least. There are times where I was falling through the world. There are times where I was getting stuck in the grass. Like That's not part of the game? The grass. No, it's an early, early alpha build. They literally, the, the studio even kind of said, like, this is an alpha, alpha, like alpha, alpha. Free alpha <laughs> build, right? It is. There are buildings that don't have textures yet. Nice. There are buildings that you can still see, <laughs> like, the polygons in it. Like, it is a rough, rough build. But saying that, it's really fun. And it's doing things that a lot of these Battle Royale games aren't doing, whereas there are, like, cash registers and place where you can pick up money and other loot items so you can actually buy weapons on the map. Or if you die, you can carry that money into your end, or your character and buy, like, cosmetic items and things like that. And the gameplay feels good. There's not a lot of building in Fortnite. It's not as competitive as PUBG. There's a role mechanic, which I really like about it. Um, so it, it's fun, but it's it's nasty, and I'm saying this very, it's just disgusting, because there's already opportunities for you to pay for, it it's already has, like, DLC components in it, where you what? can put in real money to buy, like, cosmetic items, yet you can't even create a female character yet. Because this game is so alpha. I'm sorry, so this game this game doesn't have textures on buildings, but you can buy cosmetic upgrades? You can, you can put in your money to get jewels, so you can buy, like, flannel shirts or hats or pants. And I would be all about this game if that component wasn't in there. And that is the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen. To me, I don't I don't think that's if it's a free to play game, I don't I don't mind that. Wait for the beta, dude. Like I, I see, but also like in in my opinion, like I don't know, if it's just to get like a flannel shirt, I don't think that's as disgusting if it was like an actual gameplay thing and also it's like just like people are stupid and gonna give them money. I don't know, I just in my mind it's like I'm not gonna give them my money and yeah. if it doesn't make it I, I, I would rather video game studios that are making these competitive shooters give the opportunity for people to spend money if it's on cosmetics. Like, I don't care about that. As long as it's not, like, to progress your character's, like, XP yeah. or to do stuff. I don't know. Like, I'm not saying I like this format, but of all the pay-to-wins crap that's out there these days, like, I don't think this is that egregious. That's just me. And I agree with you on cosmetic items and things like that for you to pay for, but this game is, like, pre-alpha, alpha, 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 and my problem is, like, Fortnite can do it, right? Because Fortnite at least has a feasible product. It run Fortnite runs amazing. It runs, like, a full-fledged release. I think they're just in the early access so they can provide updates um, so that when they kind of completely release the game, they, they have something to fall back on. But this game is, like I said, there's no textures in some buildings. This game has, there's nothing completed about this game at all. But yet they're asking people to put in money to buy cosmetic items. My opinion is at least bring it into a beta form so people can at least see what the game might look like because you have no idea where this game's going to go yet. So I could be putting in money into this game and then they could decide that they want to go a completely different direction with this game because that's how early in development this game is. Um, I mean, what so a weird I mean, juxtaposition to talk about this after talking about God of War. You know, it's like, this is exactly what we were saying. And again, like, like you, you don't care about making like a great piece of art or like making a great game. You care about making money out of your game, which is fine. Whatever. I mean, it's a completely different thing. But like, if you do that, do not call yourself like an artist or a game maker. Like, you're you're just you're just trying to squeeze money out of people. You make pachinko machines. You know, I was gonna say that it's like yeah, and, and that's that's kind of why I don't get that upset about it because when I read about this game, I was like, oh yeah, this seems like. People that are going to go into the free-to-play Battle Royale market are not about 
being artists and making yeah. a piece of crap. They're just like, oh, Fortnite and PUBG are killing it right now. Fortnite is insane. They're having server issues. Let's try to steal a little bit of their lunch. Let's try to get a little bit of that money. It's just like the way I look at it. Say you have this gigantic restaurant that's open. It's making tons of money. This new little restaurant opens up next to it. They notice the big restaurant gets hit with a health code or something, so people can't go there. There's a lot of foot traffic. You're under construction, but you're going to still open up your doors and have a crappy menu, but have a few items. And if people are going to come in and give you money, you're going to accept yeah, it. Yeah, true. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not saying this is something I want to pay. I want to play it and give them their money. Like, I'll probably never play this game. But also, I don't blame them for taking money because people are going to spend it. And they're going out to make money. They're not making a Yeah, and you're right, Colin, because at the end of the day, it's people's money, and they can do whatever they want with their money, and who the hell am I to tell you what to do with your money? Right. Um, but still, mm -hmm. it's just a, this act of early access game, and I don't think I've said this, but this game is free to download. I, played, I didn't pay any money to play it, but these games that are releasing, that are being released, not finished, that are being released as bare bones experience, but yet still asking for me to pay money for certain things just it puts a bad taste in my mouth. Yep. And it makes me very concerned about where the industry that I love is going. Because we're seeing we're not seeing we're only seeing one God of War a year. We're seeing a whole bunch of like these type of battle royales being pumped out or these type of Clash of Clan type money grabs being pumped out per year. And relatively, they seem to do well. I mean, look at Radical Heights. It exploded this week when Fortnite went down. I, I think that number one streamer, what Ninja, who has all the Drake people on there, Drake people, um, he, he was even on it this week. Yep. So, I mean... Look, I think what, what Pat said, he said, they're making virtual pachinko machines. Yeah, basically. Where anyone can access it and, it, and it has a shooter. But at the end of the day, you know, people that are going to put a lot of time, there's something psychological... To be like, you know what, I, I got this for free, and I, I could throw five bucks into yeah. this. Like, it's, there's something psychological there. Yeah, it's it's the music industry right now, you know? It's just, you pump out garbage and just try and get people to buy as much as possible. If you want to buy a Fetty Wap album, go nuts. Like, spend your money on it if that's what you like. But don't look me in the face and tell me that Fetty Wap is Tupac. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. Don't do that ever. It's, um, it's just like the the type of people. It, it depends on what you want to play in life. It's like you know, right now I think the three of us. If I have a few hours to kill, I want to jump into a God of War and get that experience. But these type of games are geared towards that middle school student that doesn't have any money to spend on a game, but right. they can download a free to play game. And who knows? Maybe <laughs> at one point they take their parents' credit card and they buy some free like some loot and stuff. So it's. It just depends on what your studio is set out to do. Is it trying to make a lot of money, but also create a artistic piece of, of, of right. art, of actual right. art? Right. Or right. do you want to create a virtual pachinko machine yeah. where you're just going to take uh, people's money on stuff? And, and I have to agree with you guys, it seems. And as much as fun as I had with this game yesterday, it, like even yesterday, I don't know if anyone follows Cliff Lezinski, but he tweeted at Epic Games. Epic Games are the developers behind Fortnite. And he goes, hey, Epic Games, could you please stop trying to hire my team? We just launched Radical Heights on UE4 and are really happy how it's going. So it seems like he's trying to manufacture controversy to get people to talk about this game. Dude, so. it's, it's just garbage. It's just garbage, garbage, garbage. You know, like, I'm just... Whatever. The industry's getting big, so you're going to start getting this kind of crap pumped into it just because it makes money and it's easy to do. But it's like, I don't know, man, it's it's still an art form. Making games is an art form. And would you rather be Michael Bay or do you want to be Martin Scorsese? Like, just... <sighs> Whatever, man. Person. People, yeah, because you guys yeah. know how much Michael Bay money is. Yeah, 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 I guess so, right? Like, those movies make him a lot of money, you know what I mean? So. Cool. In 50 years, no one's going to be thinking about Michael Bay. <laughs> you know? And who would you rather be? I don't know. If you want to be rich, go for it. Be Michael Bay. Yeah. And you know what's sad is I'm sitting here like on my like high chair, like sitting here talking about God of War and art, but then when I saw the, <laughs> the movie ad for the Meg with Jason Statham fighting a Megalodon hey. shark, I'm like, I have seen that movie. Don't you yeah, besmirch the me. Meg. This guy sends me a text message like, oh, this movie looks so good. <laughs> I'm watching it, and I'm not trying to hurt his feelings, but I love Paul Blow <laughs> my heart. I'm like, what? And he, he was genuinely excited about well, no, it. I, I am genuinely excited, <laughs> but I also get genuinely excited about Deep Blue Sea, and I understand that's a terrible movie, but I love it. Oh, I love if you bash one more horror. masterpiece shark movie, I'm going to punch you in your face.
<laughs> Deep Blue Sea is a piece of art, and the Meg, I have not seen anything beyond the trailer, and that movie will be a piece of art. Hanging in the Louvre. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really am excited about the Meg. I am too, actually. Yeah. So. I wonder if he took this route, and I know we're going kind of loud, but I wonder if he took this route because Lawbreakers just... It's so oh, bad. It's oh, garbage. It's so bad. No one was. Qu- hey, I was a chump who gave money to this guy, and I'm so angry because I love the art style of Lawbreakers, and I saw a couple streamers playing. I'm like, you know what? At the time, I was looking for a shooter. It was not a game. One, I was good at. Two, it's just too competitive of a shooter that I just like, like old school Quake. I was not good enough for it. And three, even with the $30 price point, no one was playing it. And this game is a direct response to that. They put a lot of effort and money into that Lawbreakers game. That model did not work out for them. They saw the uh, Battle Royale blowing up. And so, like, hmm, let's make a free-to-play and have cosmetics. And that, that's literally, in my mind, that's how it played out. Dude, this guy's, this guy's, like, his gold standard game, Cliffy B's gold standard game, is Slim Jims Presents Gears of War. I mean, the most bro game. The game that is known for just putting a chainsaw on a gun. That's why that game is famous. <laughs> and, and for all the, like, I don't, dude, I, I'm afraid to talk about Gears of War on, like, a public forum because their fans are so... Just like, <laughs> hey, bro, how about I take my, my ATV over to your house? Uh, yeah, but you're right. He did. He was behind on real tournament too, right? Yeah. I believe so. Yeah, I guess a thousand years ago. It's yeah, just like also the like the, the, bro-y, the like 1998 unreal. bro game of the of yeah. So I mean, and I I don't know the guy, so um, I just I don't. It's just this is this is gross. Yeah, it's just gross. I don't. I can't think of any <laughs> other words to say but gross. And and you can't really blame him because. I mean, that early access thing is just so big right now. Every game is being released in an alpha or a beta, not yeah. complete. They're asking people to pay for money. They're asking people to pay for cosmetics to support the development. Just, and Just look at it this way. When you have a business that takes advantage of some new tax loophole that saves a ton of money for them, when every other business gets wind of that, they are all going to go and do that and get that same tax uh, loophole so they can save money. Video game studios that are out to just make profit and that's it. Like, you know, Pat was saying that aren't really into that creating art, which a lot of studios that way, even if you, let me take a step back. There are people in these studios, I'm sure, do care about artistic uh, approach to things, but they're in a corporate environment where they aren't the decision maker. The people at the top that are worried about the return on investment for shareholders, they're going to go out and try to figure out money. And I'm sure Cliffy B., Regardless of what he may say, he's the head of a studio. He's always concerned with making money. Oh, yeah. And that's he, how it goes. He's probably concerned with keeping his staff and things like that. So, Lawbreakers was such a tra- travesty that he probably is very concerned about his studio going down. So, you well, know, he's, and he's probably concerned, too, that Epic is a large studio that can poach talent because they have a lot of yeah. money, and he probably doesn't have the capital to just continually get pay raises to keep staff in the building. Then so, make better pieces of yeah. art to attract people <laughs> who want to make art. But anyway, getting back to the stuff that, but Radical Heights is fun. If you want to play it for free, play it for free, but don't don't put any money into it, please. Yeah. Um, Plus, that just why like also why would anyone want to put money into a game that they only have like three hairstyles and like that just is like and if, no females. If, if you put money into that game, you are either a Kong. small child that has stolen a credit card, or you <laughs> don't deserve to have that money in your bank account. Colin, I'm sorry. Colin, one of the hairstyles is Jerry curls. So yes. It is Jerry oh, okay, Curl. never mind. I take everything I, back. My this character had a Jerry Curl, yeah. This is the perfect game. It is a masterpiece on the level of God of War. <laughs> I want my Jerry Curl character. I will only play Radical Heights. This probably speaks to me as a person, but I was really upset that there were no women in the game because I always create a female character, and then when I saw that there was Jerry Curl, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Like, we don't need a woman. We have Jerry. Hey, apparently they, there is highway to the danger zone in the game. Like, that's the funny thing to me is that they don't have character <laughs> models, yet they, yet they pay for 80s, the rights for 80s music. That's why they have cosmetics, so they can pay for that song. That is, probably. like, I'm sorry, that just clicked in my head right now, that they are willing to pay for the rights for, like, 80 songs by Kenny Loggins, but they won't put the time to make sure you can create a female character. Yeah, that's about it in a nutshell right there. So, yeah, they are doing some new stuff. Um, 
I don't, I don't think I highlighted it, but like cosmetics are out there in the map, so you have to actually find the cosmetics before you buy them. I don't think PUBG and Fortnite are doing that. Ugh, who cares? And they have a cash component. But other than that, I mean, it's another Battle Royale game. I don't see the Battle Royale gen- genre staying around long, to be honest with you. It's a, I don't see what innovation you can really do to this genre. I, I just see them dying off like MOBAs died off. I don't know if you guys remember, but like five to ten years ago, not even ten years, when we were in college, MOBAs were all the rage. Like, everyone wanted to get in the MOBAs. Everyone was getting in the MOBAs. MOBAs were all over Spike TV. The only MOBA you really hear about now is... Speaking of Epic Games, they're shutting down Paragon servers next week. Or in two weeks. Yeah, so, because MOBAs are dead. Yeah, because they're, they're putting all their money in Fortnite. In Battle so. Royales. Yeah. So, I wonder if this is going to be another genre of games that we're going to see die off soon. Or, is it going to be less of a one-mode game, or is it going to be like back in the day when Team Deathmatch was new, and then all of a sudden every shooter had Team Deathmatch in their games that used to be just first-person single-player yeah. games? Yeah. So is this going to be a game mode included? Like, I, there's rumors it's going to be in Red Dead somehow. Like, is this going to be just like an added game mode you can throw in? Or are we going to see a continue of, of games creating... Uh, an entire uh, studio creating an entire game around the battle royale mode. I hope and not. That's so lazy. Way, yeah, and this is a way different conversation to have about what Rockstar did with their online. Like, oh, see, if, if they created a battle royale, it would it would be a just a game mode, and I anything Rockstar wants to do with that, I have full confidence yeah. in, and they would not put it in the game if it's not at least decent. We have to shout. We have to shout out Rockstar every week. I feel like on this podcast, like we put them they're, on. Well, they're, hey, they're dude, like, so we say in Monaco yeah. that they're willing to invest in their game. They create games like they do it the right way. Yeah, this is going to be a crazy game of the year year. Because you had God of War and a Red Dead Redemption 2 coming out in the same year. Yeah, right? we'll see, right? Like, Yeah, this is going to be crazy. Plus, you have people that like are really passionate maybe um, about like Monster Hunter, mm-hmm. like, which mm-hmm. like because that's not story-driven, but the actual gameplay itself people are super passionate mm-hmm. about. Yeah, th- I mean, it's it's the beginning, it's middle of April right now, and we're already with like some solid games. Yeah, yeah. It's good. That's- I mean, there's still there's still people out there making real games. No, oh, absolutely, we're, and we're not, you know, I, I know we're a lot of doom and gloom on there, but we, we spent like a good 45 minutes talking about how amazing God of War is, so. Yeah. So you get some, still, you get some ahead, crow, you get a little bit of crow with your turkey. Yeah, that's it, that's it. At the end of the day, give your money to the publishers that are making these games, and if you can, uh, invest in studios like that. Buy stock for 2K if you like what they're doing. Like, incentivize these studios to do the right thing by giving your money to the studios that do it and then don't give your money to studios that are putting out crap. Yep. Yeah. Or give your money to us. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or just send us send us a blank check. To yeah. Pat's Tears. <laughs> Pat's, that, a blank check and Pat will send you his tears. Oh, I'll, like, it depends how much money you give me. Like, three tears. And a notebook full of his video game ideas. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty dark. Yeah. All right, thank you again, everyone, for joining us on the Donkey Con Artist Podcast. We love you for listening to us. As always, we are on Twitter. We are on DonkeyConArtist.com. We're on Instagram. We're all over the place. Anywhere you can find somebody, you can find us. We're on JDate. Tinder, Bumble, we're on it all. Uh, so come, come leave a comment on our website, DonkeyConArtist.com. Come leave us an email, any questions, any people you would like us to reach out to email. Thank you for your continued support. Come find us on Twitter at Donkey Kong Artists. We are always looking to engage in our community and stop putting money into bullshit. And if uh, if you took the time to listen to this podcast all the way through, just uh, here's a little virtual hug from all of us to you. Mm. Mm. Virtual hug. Virtual hug. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening. That's a song in like 14 minutes. Make sure you send us your money for past years. Yeah. Yeah, past years. Yeah. 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 Yeah.